Welcome to the Hope for the Animals podcast, sponsored by Compassionate Living. I'm your host, Hope Bohannock, and you can find all our past shows and more information at our website, hopefortheanimalspodcast.org, and you can find my contact information there as well. I'd love to hear from you. Today we have a wonderful conversation with a vegan powerhouse from the UK, Matali Deperkeshta, and we cover a lot of territory in this interview, so there's a wide array of interesting topics. But before we get into the interview, I had some announcements related to my work and my organization, Compassionate Living, that I would love to share with you. First, I wanted to tell you all that Compassionate Living is stepping up our Humane Hoax project, and we are working with a lawyer, and we're filing a lawsuit against an egg and dairy company for false advertising. Compassionate Living is the plaintiff in a lawsuit against Vital Farms. And I don't know if you've ever seen Vital Farms egg cartons or butter packaging, but I actually use them in my Humane Hoax presentations, like pictures of their packaging and their egg cartons, as examples of just blatant humane washing. Their packaging and marketing is Oh, it's infuriating. They have every humane phrase under the sun, including saying the hens are under the sun, <laughs> as well as, you know, phrases like happy hens and ethical eggs and tended by hand, whatever that means. Uh, so, so first of all, Vital Farms is not a farm. They are a company that contracts out to farms, close to 300 farms, and they sell in dozens of states under that company name. So all these different farms under the Vital Farms name. So making these really extreme welfare claims when the industry standard is so far from anything they're promising is... It's it's suspect at best, but just blatant lies at worst. How on earth could they be sure that all 300 farms are strictly enforcing all the claims of free ranging and foraging that they uh, say on their websites and their cartons? It, there's just no way. But But beyond that, what really upsets me is that they distract from so many other horrors of a hen or a cow's experience in the industry with the promise of outdoor access. It's it's like the cage-free label. They focus on confinement as if that's the only problem, as if that was the only cause of suffering. And and that's pretty much all they're promising in their array of humane phrasing is outdoor access or free ranging. But in the entirety of the industry, including Vital Farms, 300 farms, the chicks, when they're hatched, are still hatched at the hatcheries and metal drawers without their mother. They're painfully debeaked. The male chicks are killed by the billions. The hens are then shipped to these farms in the mail. Many die in transit just from the the intensity of being shipped in the mail with no food or water and being tossed around uh, by the workers. Uh, it, it's None of that is addressed. Because they couldn't. They couldn't make a profit if any of that changed. So they don't talk about that. They don't talk to the consumers about the full picture, the whole story of all the horrors of their lives. And they are, they're also not going to talk about the brutal death that they will be facing, uh, a very early death. There's no retirement plan for these supposedly happy hens laying ethical eggs. No, they will be off to the slaughterhouse as soon as their egg laying wanes in just a couple of years. So there's so much more to their suffering than what you see on the carton, what they claim in the advertising and the marketing. So I'm thrilled that we are able to bring this lawsuit to Vital Farms and call them out for their marketing misinformation, their labeling lies, and their blatant humane washing. 
I'll, I'll keep you updated on our progress with this lawsuit. And they are not the only company that we're looking into and wanting to go after. I'm, I'm so excited about this next stage, this next phase of Compassionate Living and the Humane Hoax Project's campaigning, um, bringing these lawsuits. It's very exciting. Be sure that you are on Compassionate Living's e-news list if you want to hear updates about all this and other campaigns that we have going on. You can sign up at compassionate-living.org. My second announcement is that I will be teaching a new online class this fall called Ahimsa, Animal Advocacy, and Veganism at Arihanta Academy. It's in the fall of 2022, starts in September. Arihanta Academy is an online Jain college. Jainism, or Jain Dharma, is one of the three main Dharma traditions. Hinduism and Buddhism are the two others that you might be more familiar with, but Jain Dharma is also an incredible, rich tradition, and one of their main tenets is Ahimsa. And the word ahimsa is Sanskrit for directly translated as nonviolence, but you can think about it more as like dynamic compassion or active compassion. And it's really their most important principle. And the vegan community has really embraced this word. The vegan community is seeing something in this tradition and in this word uh, that just doesn't fully translate into English and into Western culture. And there is, there's something really amazing going on here. And I have been looking deeply into it. I'm very excited to share what I've learned. You know, you see the word ahimsa on t-shirts and necklaces at veg fests and as the name of groups or online events, right? So I hope that you might come and take my class and learn more about Ahimsa and Jain Dharma and how it supports veganism. You don't need to be enrolled in the college in Arihanta Academy or anything like that. You can just take the course by signing up. It does cost something and I'm, I'm not sure exactly how much. I think it's like 50 bucks or so. It's a six-week course, and it's on Saturdays. Every Saturday starts uh, September 10th and goes for six weeks every Saturday. And we're going to focus on animal advocacy, ethics, veganism. Each class is going to be focused on a particular aspect of animal agriculture. And we'll talk about the latest science of the cognition and consciousness and emotional lives of farmed animals. We will, of course, investigate the new misleading market marketing trends of animal products that are supposedly humane and sustainable, the humane hoax. Uh, one of our classes will be devoted solely to the incredible lives of fish, and we'll discuss the latest scientific research on fish, how they navigate their complex behaviors, have individual personalities and preferences and emotions. Um, we're also going to talk about how animal agriculture and fishing is taking, of course, a devastating environmental toll on our precious planet. And we will examine the environmental issue and how it relates to the Jain concept of a parigraha or non-consumption. We're going to talk about karma and dharma and spiritual well-being, as well as the physical health benefits of a plant-based diet. It's going to cover a lot. I really hope you can join me in September if this sounds interesting to you. It's going to be really an exciting exploration into how the Jain tradition can address some of the most important issues of our modern times through veganism. Again, the class starts September 10th and will be every Saturday for six weeks after that. And it's called Ahimsa, Animal Advocacy and Veganism. I'll have a link to Arihanta Academy in the show notes uh, that will go to where you can sign up for my class. And, you know, I've been educating myself on Dharma religions for many years now through my husband, Kojin, who, of course, has his master's in Buddhism, his PhD in Hinduism, and now teaches also at Arihanta Academy. He's, he's teaching some exciting courses like uh, Jain philosophy, Jain ethics. So you should check out the Arihanta Academy. There's so much to learn and explore in this really rich Jain tradition. 
I'm so excited to finally feel like I have enough knowledge to share and feel so blessed to have the opportunity to teach this course, and I'd love for you to join me. So those are just some of the exciting things that I have going on with Compassionate Living now that I am focusing full-time on my organization. I hope that you go to our website and sign up for our e-news so you can hear more about it, compassionate-living.org. All right, so let's now hear from our very interesting guest today. I really hope you enjoy this interview. All right, I am excited to bring in our guest today. Today we have Matali Deprakesta, and she is a British Indian woman based in Gateshead near Newcastle in the UK. She is a talented writer and spent the past seven years as a copywriter and ghost writer for some of UK's top businesses before becoming a book consultant and publisher. She's a vegan of 10 years and Mitali now has a book publishing company called The Vegan Publisher. And she uses a hybrid book publishing model to help vegan and plant-based experts write books to amplify the voices of ethical entrepreneurs. Welcome to the podcast, Matali. Thank you for having me, Hope. It's wonderful to have you uh, all the way across in the UK. Uh, it's, it's fun when we have an international guest. It's early morning here and late afternoon there. It's uh, odd to think about all the different times around the world. I just, I love that. I, I love it apart from the twice a year when all the clocks change and we can't even decide on one day to change the clocks. And then <laughs> my diary goes crazy. <laughs> For a week in March and a week in October, my life is hell. Oh, so no. So the rest of the time I enjoy it, yes. <laughs> yeah, because everybody does something different. I know. It's yeah. like, first of all, I'm not even sure if we need to go forward and backwards anymore. But even if we did, can we just, guys, we're, we're a global community. Yeah, every, every, just, just everybody do the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just one day. Let's decide on one day when we're going to do it. We can't even do that. So Right. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Well, we like to start the show by hearing about how and when and why you went vegan, your vegan origin story. And I, I hear that it has something to do with a cat named Isha. Yes, Tell us about yeah. that. Yeah. She said she's so important. I've even dedicated the latest book that I wrote. I dedicated to her Aww. and another cat because they really did. They, they made the, the difference. So, yeah, I was bought up vegetarian. Um, but that was had nothing to do with being humane or anything like that. I'd love to say it was, but it wasn't. It's purely because my parents were Hindu um, and they'd grown up mainly vegetarian. Um, and then obviously when they had kids, we were vegetarian. We didn't really have much of a choice. That uh -huh. was just how things were. And then going into my teens, I grew up in a predominantly white area and I felt well, I already felt isolated. I'll be honest with you. I, I was picked upon. This is 80s England, which is very different to what England is like now. Overt racism was just normal back then. I mean, we all know racism still exists, sadly. Uh, the last few years have proven that. However, at least it's more subversive now. It's kind of most people will hide the fact that they're racist. Back then, that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. So I always felt isolated, as did the rest of my family anyway and then the fact that we didn't eat meat and you know this was the era when McDonald's went you know really big in the UK and I couldn't join in with the rest of the kids I you know I couldn't have a Big Mac so then unfortunately in my teens I decided to start eating meat the change to came start, about to start eating meat again or to starting to start for, eating for the meat first time period. yeah right, for the first right. time because okay. I'd, I'd never eaten meat because I, wow. I was brought up in a vegetarian household right um so it's quite sad to say I wish I'm you know you know you'd see these science fiction movies where you can go back in a time machine and have a word with yourself uh -huh. <laughs> if that ever if that ever did exist I would love to go back and just say oh what are you doing you know Aww. talk about going backwards in your evolution yeah um so that was me for a number of years and then my family decided to uh, rescue a cat. I was against it, I'll be honest with you. Um, at that time, I wasn't a huge fan of animals. 
more because of my own prejudices. It, mm. it wasn't with any experience of animals. I just came from this background where animals are seen as beings that should be outside and humans are inside and the mm. two don't meet. None of it how, made how old, any... How old were you at that time? I would have been 29. Oh, okay. Okay. So it's so- this isn't, yeah. This was well into my 20s, going ah, into my 30s. Okay. And um, just, just goes to show how much we, how much of what we think we know is just stuff that's been fed into us. You know, mm. we think like we're so intelligent and, you know, we really know our mind and all those things. And the truth is we don't. We mm. are a, a composite of everything that's gone before us and all of that stuff that's put into our brains from a very early age. So, yeah, I, most Indian families back then anyway um, saw animals as, you know, wonderful creatures. I mean, I think Hindus are known for being a, some of the kindest people on the planet, but they were outside creatures and, mm. in, and you know, humans were indoor creatures. So the two should meet. And I just thought, oh, God, I'm going to have fluff everywhere when it's gone. <laughs> I wasn't happy, to be honest. I really, really didn't want this cat to come into our lives. The, the only reason I said yes was my youngest sister. She was 14 at the time. And my mother forbade her from having a cat in the house. So she then decided to go and petition a whole school to, and got about 200 signatures to say that we should allow her to have a cat. And I just looked at my mother oh. and I said, <laughs> I just thought we have to. I mean, what teenager does that? Right. I mean, that's remarkable. <laughs> I mean, most teenagers just. They, you know they get angry and they, oh, you don't understand me door slamming and you know typical teenage behavior we had a teenager that went and petitioned to whole school and even got all the teachers and a head teacher to sign and I just to, thought we kind let, of to to let her have a cat yes that's so funny so I, love I almost felt like I said to my mother I said we have to reward this kind of behavior you can't not reward this kind of behavior this is so unlike teenage normal teenage mm. experiences that people have with teenagers it's so we we looked to me and said okay go on then so <laughs> this cat turned up in my life um not very happy with it and then within I think it took less than a month hope it was less than a month and I was just marveling at this cat mm. she was only a year old and she just the sentience hope that was what floored me mm. the sentience of this little being they just knew she knew who needed her the most it, that day so who was having a bad day that day who was having a terrible time at work who was having a terrible time at school who was Aww. bored and needed you know needed a bit of entertainment and she would go to that family member as and when they she knew they needed her wow and I just thought wow you know and the realization that this is sick like what I'm doing uh, and without realizing what I've been doing is nothing short of an animal holocaust and that's what I I, it took me it took me about three years in total I went down that um foolish route that a lot of us go down when we start doing all this you talk about this a lot hope which I love you for you know with the humane hoax I went down that silly route you know Mm. oh I'll just go to organic farms and I'll just you know all of that kind of stuff and you you fool yourself for a while but if you have a conscience after a while you realize that you can only fool yourself for a certain amount of time until you realize that it's just wrong and then when it finally dawned on me, I just thought, I can't do this anymore. And that was in 2012. And I haven't looked back since. Mm. And now I wonder why it took me that long. <laughs> you know, right. I, think I, I yeah. should have been, well, I should have never eaten meat. And I should have actually gone from vegetarian to vegan. Gosh, in my teens or uh, my early 20s. Well, so social pressure is very difficult. And it's something that we need to really look at. We need to make veganism acceptable in social circles because that can be a really hard thing for people. That people want to be accepted, they want to feel like they fit in, and uh, and it and it you know it takes courage to do something different. So um, so I'm glad you did that. You came around to it eventually, but you know I can understand in in your teens, just having that um, you know that desire to fit in. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. 
Well, let's, I, I actually want to ask a little bit about your childhood. Let's go back in time because okay. I find it fascinating that you were raised speaking Bengali. I mean, I believe you were in the UK, but you, uh, your household spoke Bengali and you didn't speak English until about the age of four. Yes. And that you taught yourself to read in libraries. And, and I wonder if this is maybe where your love of writing and books come from. I'd love to, to hear about that. That's amazing. Um, yeah, it, I, I have to assume so. Um, I have to assume that's where my love of books came from. So, yeah, even though I was born in the UK, you can tell from my accent that I don't have an Indian accent. But I was the oldest of four. And my mother had literally only been in the country, you know, for a year and then she had me. So my mother spoke no English. So I grew up speaking Bengali. Mm. So my first experience of English was going to school. It was uh, at the age of four is when you go to school here in the UK. We got a nursery, which I believe is similar to kindergarten. Kindergarten, yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's where I went. So I don't remember any of this, but my mother tells me okay. that I was going around speaking to all these kids very animatedly. Um, I was an overly friendly child, <laughs> perhaps. Um, <laughs> and they would just all look at me as if I've just grown a second head right there. And then, so who is this very weird girl? Because um, you're speaking I, Bengali. I think it's a mixture of everything. First of all, I was the only brown kid there. Kid there. Remember, uh -huh. this is 80s England in a very uh, predominantly white area. So for a lot of these kids, they'd never even seen a child of color before. Mm -hmm. So I was strange anyway. And then here I come speaking this very strange language that they couldn't understand. <laughs> so they just kind of shunned me. They just, mm -hmm. you know, just walked away from me and didn't want to speak to me. She tells me that after that, she dropped me off at nursery and I would just run to the corner library. Wow. That was just where I was there. And then after a year, my nursery teacher told my mother that they had to buy new books because I've read through all the books at this wow. stage. So, oh, yeah, I ended up yeah. teaching myself the language. And I'm sure my teachers helped as well. That is their job as nursery teachers. <laughs> and then when I started school, as in the proper school, primary school, we call it, I was now ahead of everybody else. And I remained ahead of all the kids by at least a year throughout my schooling. Wow. That's just stayed with me. Wow. And and at that time, you you said that you did also experience some racism uh, and even colorism as a child. And I wonder if you could talk about that and maybe explain to our listeners what colorism is. I don't know that it's as well known in the U.S., uh, that aspect of racism. Yeah. Well, it is. I'm glad you said that, Hope. It is an aspect of racism. And yeah. it's... Um, it's quite interesting that, you know, people can be guilty of colorism, but then they're very sensitive to racism and they don't see that it's the same thing, huh. you know, that it comes from the same place. So colorism is basically, it's racism, but whereas racism is to do with color when it comes to different races, colorism is making someone feel disadvantaged in some way because of the color of their skin, usually darkness of the skin within a race. So for me, colorism is when Indian people don't see me as equal to them because they're lighter skinned than I am. Mm. But the, if you look at the history behind that, it comes from colonial times. So racism and colorism, although separate, are also together. Yeah. You know, it comes from the same place. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I would say growing up, my experiences of colorism were actually more painful than racism. I think with racism, I can almost... Not okay it, but I can almost just see it as, well, they're just, they're just dumb. They don't get it, you know? Like I, most immigrants growing up in the 80s will tell you the thing that they heard the most in England was go home, which made no sense because, like, well, my home is Gateshead. I was born yeah. here. Where do I oh. go home yeah. to exactly? Yeah. Where is home mm. when I was born here? But, yeah. you know, if you ask any um, immigrants, particularly of colour, growing up in 80s England they'll say oh yeah we, we all heard that but go home I could almost kind of in my head I can say okay well these people are just stupid they obviously have no idea that home for me is here what hurt more with colorism is this feeling that you should know better 
I think that's why colorism hurts me more. Mm. Um, my earliest experience of colorism is, I think I must have been about probably six or seven. I'd gone to a family gathering. It was like a community gathering. So loads of Indian families were getting together. And I was, I'm considerably darker than any other member of my family. And I just remember a number of people coming up to my dad or my mom and just saying, you know, things like, oh, she's she's a little bit dark now, isn't she? You should really think about maybe getting her educated because at least that'll be something that she have going for her. So oh, they're already oh, thinking oh. in terms of, oh. I know, they're already thinking in terms of, you know, my prospects for marriage. And I'm like a six, seven-year-old girl. Oh, and they're already oh, thinking awful. in terms of, God, I know, awesome. I know. Ugh. And I, I'll be honest with you, I don't remember being aware of what marriage was. I don't think I had any interest in boys at the age of six or seven. But I still remember feeling like I wasn't good enough. I just remembered I'm not good enough for something. I don't know what that thing is, but I'm obviously not good enough for it. Mm. And that's really harmful to learn as a child. that Somehow something that you can't even control makes you not good enough. Um, so certainly I would say colorism, is, uh, colorism has affected me even more so than racism. Wow. Wow. I'm so sorry that you had to go through oh, bless that you. as a You child. don't have to. How you awful. honestly don't have to be because I'm a big believer. That's kind of, I would actually say my experiences of, of racism and even more so colorism is probably partly why I became vegan. Um, I was listening wow. to one of your earlier episodes oh what was the name of the gentleman wonderful gentleman um oh, Christopher Eubanks uh-huh. and he yes. was yes he was talking about you know he had that internal conflict you know he was standing up for people of color and you know educating them on the you know systemic oppression and then he was part of the systemic oppression of these other non-human beings mm. and that hypocrisy and that realization that hang on a minute how can I be standing up for this on the one hand and then I'm for it on the other hand and it's a similar thing for me I know what it feels like to be reduced down to a race or a skin color and that's it never mind all the other multifaceted being that I am forget all that just reducing down to one thing and if you think about it more so than any human animals feel that even more than us so we we decide that oh dog is pet and cow is food we're just doing that nobody else is that's just us deciding what is food what is pet what is something to test on and so on and so forth they're they're reduced down to these objects yeah and I just thought I know what that feels like and that's not good why would I be part of that I really do believe my experiences of colorism and racism really has helped me so much in understanding my veganism and mm. also my compassion towards people who aren't vegan yet, or, you know, as a number of my friends call them pregan. Yes. Pre-vegan. Pre-vegans, uh, yes. Yeah. Pregan. I think that's a great, great word to Definitely. explain, you know, these people and everyone, and the whole world is pregan. The whole world is pregan. Yeah. Cause yeah, I mean, we have to get that. We have to go vegan. Otherwise we're actually going to eat ourselves to extinction the way we're that's going right. at the moment. So that's we have right. to go, it has to happen. So that's why I think of them as pregans, yeah. but I do have a lot of compassion towards them because I don't think the average person, you know, sits down to eat a steak and, and thinks, yes, I'm eating a dead cow. They're not it's just complete cognitive dissonance. They're just not even thinking Mm -hmm. in the same way that I can have a cousin who can get upset about the racism that Indians are experiencing in the Middle East, for example, but then literally be rubbing on whitening cream at the same time while they're complaining about it and not see the link. It's Mm -hmm. the same thing when people are sitting down, they're eating cheese and they're drinking milk and they're just, they're just very, very unaware. And it's our job to lift them, to inspire them into seeing what's going on. Wow. Well said, really wonderful stuff, making those uh, connections with all of that. I love that. Yeah. So at the age of 16, you won a script writing scholarship to a summer school in Scotland and you loved writing. You've always loved writing and you contributed in your early writing career to a long running UK soap opera, Brookside. And that all evolved into you now having a book publishing company called The Vegan Publisher. 
So can you tell us about that journey from writing to publishing? Um, so, yeah, I think I've, I've always written well before I won that scholarship to the summer school. Okay. I was writing all the time, but I guess I grew up in a typical immigrant family. And, you know, I think I speak not just for Indian immigrants here or Bangladeshi immigrants. I think I speak for all kinds of immigrants in the, you know, your parents, they love you to death and they want the best for you. But because they've usually come from either poverty or conflict or something's gone wrong, usually where where they were based and they've now come to this new country, they put this baggage on you without meaning to they don't mean to do it but they put this baggage on you and they expect you to live for them almost you know make sure that you get all the things that they didn't get and they Mm. they give you yeah it's it's and they don't mean to do it because I I I don't I'm yet to meet a parent that actually knowingly does that to a child but without meaning to, that's what immigrant parents do. So I had this whole, you know, you've been given an opportunity that we would have never have had. And um, my dad put me through a private school as well. I was very good in the sciences. So straight away, there was this expectation that I would become a doctor. So I went along with it. You know, I never really saw writing as a career choice. Mm. It was just something that I did because it was fun an extension of me enjoying reading. That's all it was. Uh And then I I didn't even apply for this scholarship. Hope It was one of my teachers took one of my essays and sent it to this competition. Uh And then she heard back and said I was one of the 30 kids around the UK who had been picked to go to the summer school. And that's when I knew about it. So I was excited to go. But even then, I wasn't thinking in terms of, a career or anything I was just thought why not this is just going to be something fun oh this is really cool I'll, I'll go and do some writing it's fun I really wasn't expecting it to change my viewpoint or anything like that I know my parents didn't expect that otherwise they wouldn't have let me go if they thought I was going to come back such a changed girl they would have <laughs> just grounded me and said nope you're not going to Scotland no way <laughs> But there was something about being with a group of people who really were passionate about writing and then being able to co-create an episode of Brookside. It made me, something just clicked to me. I just thought, oh my God, this is a viable career option. Mm. I just never saw it as that before. So when I came back, I came back a completely changed girl. And my dad didn't even speak to me for six months. He was so upset that I was not going to do medicine. And oh. yeah, it, 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 I mean, it did come around. It took some time, but it came around. And then ended up doing media studies um, at university and then went on to do a master's in journalism. Somewhere between all of that, he actually got over it and he started speaking <laughs> to me again, which was great. Um, but yeah, it, it was something that, you know, really did come by accident to me. I never saw it as a career option. I really, really didn't. Mm-hmm. And then going into publishing, that again was a happy accident. I was writing articles and sales pages and landing pages and emails for a number of different businesses around the world. And then one of my clients asked me to write a nonfiction book for him. I just remember being quite petrified and thinking, oh, my gosh, I've never written anything like this before. But my client was really he was really gentle with me. And he just said, look, I'm not even going to give you a deadline. You take as long as you want. But I really like the way you write all everything else for my business. So I would like you to write my book for me. But there's no deadline. You take your time. It took me nearly 18 months to write that first book. But he was so happy with it. It did wonders for his business as well. He was, able to, he was able to leverage it everywhere. And, you know, he ended up getting on. He actually got his own local sh- TV show as well off the back of that book. So oh. he was very, very happy with it. Mm. And then that started other people contacting me and saying, hey, can you write a book for me? So I started ghostwriting books. And then after writing my seventh book, I'd done it in under six weeks. Wow. And it was arguably better than the first. In fact, I know it was better than the first book. So yeah. it had nothing to do with the amount of time that I was putting into it. And I know that I've got a recipe that just works. Hmm. So it dawned on me, why don't I just show people the recipe? And then that way they can write their own books. And then that way that's more people I can impact and more people who are happy than I can do on my own. 
writing books. And that's been true since um, I set up my publishing company. I've published 16 people in under two years. There's no way I would have written 16 books in under two years. Right, right. Um, so that's where that came about. And then even becoming a vegan publisher was a happy accident. My first book, the first edition of the Freedom Master Plan, that's the name of my book, came out in March of last year. I'd been vegan at that time, at that point, nine years I'd been vegan. And yet for some strange reason, I just didn't put two and two together. For me, my veganism, my animal advocacy, that was something I did in private. I'm, I'm not privately, as in you can see it all over my social media. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, so separate, I wasn't doing it from your work. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I wasn't <laughs> private otherwise. Or what kind of animal advocate would you be if you're private about it? You know, but I just, that was something I did in my private life and my business. My career was my career. But then my first book came out, the first edition, I should say, came out. A lovely vegan lady called Heather Landix, who is an inclusivity consultant. What she does is she goes around restaurants in the UK and shows them how to become more inclusive to vegans. And she heard about me and she just kind of, you know, <laughs> dragged me into these vegan and plant-based circles. And I said, come on, you're going to have to come and meet these vegan entrepreneurs and uh, so I just followed her into these circles and was just floored and so inspired by these people. And I just thought, these are the people I really want to work with. The people that I was meeting, these people that had a real mission, a real love for what they do. A passion. They really genuinely believed in wanting to leave the world a better place than, uh, than before they saw it. Mm. I always say, I always jokingly say, I think somebody did some big webinar back in 2016, because now what happens is all of these people have these missions and I don't really believe them most of the time. I think it's mainly a marketing ploy. I think if you, if you ever see it on LinkedIn, hope you'll see it. Everyone's on a mission to do something on LinkedIn. I'm just <laughs> like, yeah, really? I'm just convinced someone did a big webinar a few years ago. And now it's uh, gone into this entrepreneurial psyche that we all need to have these grandiose missions mm. because it's a marketing thing. Well, I know when, I'm, when I have a vegan, ethical, plant-based entrepreneur in front of me, I know their mission is for real. Because it's tough to be an entrepreneur in this sector. We have extra pressures on us because we're trying to do things right and it's crazy but sadly true that doing things right usually costs you more money than not doing things right mm -hmm. you know I, I've spoken to entrepreneurs who are trying to cut down their carbon footprint and that usually means they have less profits in their business than a, a, an equivalent business that doesn't care about stuff like that yeah I know when I'm speaking with those kinds of people, their mission is for real. It's not a made up marketing ploy. It's real. And that passion comes out in the books. Yeah. So it makes the book more exciting. And yeah, mm -hmm. I love it. I will say to my clients, you know, because a lot of my clients come to me with, they're worrying about things that they're my worries, you know, and they're worrying about it. So for example, they'll, they'll say things like, my grammar is terrible. You know, I was terrible at school with English and, oh, I don't even know how to structure a book. It's like, that's my worry as a book consultant. That's my job to do. Hmm. What I can't do for you is give you passion. That just is something either you have it or you don't, yeah. you know, yeah. and doesn't matter how good a book consultant I am. I can't make you passionate about something right. that you know and that is one of the key reasons I love working within this sector of entrepreneurs working with vegan and plant-based and ethical entrepreneurs because they just come to me with a ton of passion yeah. everything else I can fix your grammar the editing the structure that's my job and my team we can fix that <laughs> but what we can't do is give you passion right right and and you have a book that I would love to ask about uh, called the Freedom Master Plan. I think you mentioned it earlier. Yeah. And it, so it's called the Freedom Master Plan, put your mission, movement, and message on the map for vegans and ethical experts, influencers, and entrepreneurs. So tell us about this book. I think it's kind of a practical guide, right? To kind of increase and help entrepreneurs increase their clients' profits. Uh, tell, tell us about this book and, and maybe why you wrote it. The reason why I wrote it, Hope, is I realized quite early on that most people don't need convincing 
they're writing a book is a great idea for their business, their charity, their organization, whatever it is that they're running. Because I think you can't really, every time you go to a summit or a conference, the keynote speaker is always best-selling author of such and such book. So we kind of know, we know it works. We know instinctively that writing a book does something for you when it comes to your authority, being seen as an expert, being seen as better than others, uh, any of your competitors. We all instinctively know that. Mm. Where the disconnect was when I was researching it was people just didn't know exactly what do I do with the book. So I I publish it, then what? Mm. I know it does good things for me, but how do I get it to do good things for me? And that's where the disconnect was. Mm. So what I decided to do was to interview seven of my clients who've gone on to do amazing things with their books. And I just asked them, I just, I spent a summer interviewing them and I just asked them, what did you do? You know, what did you do with the book? Tell me exactly what you did. Cause they've all gone on to build these huge businesses now. And I just thought if I can just record it from the horse's mouth, so to speak, I don't know if that's a vegan term, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I also have to be one. very careful because <laughs> I'll tell you what, Hope, it amazes me how much of the English language uses terrible and, and, and animal and some of them um, are not nice yeah. you know things like knocking two birds with one stone and I'm thinking how about you don't knock any birds with any stone that would yeah. be easier <laughs> yeah. you know that's or the, another one that's really terrible is that, that's you funny know, wait so so in UK you say knock two birds because here we say uh, uh something different what do we say um okay. oh killing kill two birds with one stone that's what we say we actually use oh, the word God, kill you, you, yeah you guys are worse than us yeah <laughs> We, we always, we, always. <laughs> we say we knock two birds out with one stone, but it's the same thing. You're still yeah, killing them, but no, you know, maybe it's the, the polite British thing again, you know. A good way to say it is um to feed two birds with one hand is what but you that can would say. be perfect. Why, yeah. why don't we use that? There we yeah. go. Yeah. But another one that I really hate is oh, you can't swing a cat in here. You want to say oh. that a room is really small, and you just say, Well, why would you be swinging a cat anyway? Just don't swing any cats. Oh, it's awful. <laughs> It's an awful, it's a horrible, horrible yeah. sayings that we have in English. I just yeah. think, oh my God. So, but I think this one's okay because from the horse's mouth. Yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. have to look that up. Let's see if any, we'll any have to look that up. If we'll any listeners, if any listeners know, you know, <laughs> let us know what the origin of that one is. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to know. Um, so yeah, that was the idea. So rather than just give people a load of theory, which is quite boring, I just thought, let me just speak to people who have done amazing things with the books that they wrote and just have it all in an easy laid out plan and the goal was that by the time you get to the end of my book either you'll be raring to go and you'll just think yes I need to write a book I know exactly how my book is going to fit in with my business my organization how it's going to fit in with my current marketing efforts because it all works together you know it's not just write a book and that's it it's all about how it fits in with whatever you're doing at the moment you know, I, I say this in my in my book as well. I say it in the Freedom Mass Man, the book is not the business. You know, right. the book is there. It's a it's a to, it's a very elaborate business card. It really is. <laughs> and it's as my as my subtitle says, it's a it's a, a very wonderful way to get your mission and your movement and message out there yeah. in a bigger way. Because yeah. if you think about it, as a vegan or plant-based or ethical entrepreneur, that's why we do what we do. You know, we want to impact as many people as possible. We want people to understand what they're doing is harmful and they don't realize it and why our way of doing things is a better way of living. Yes. You just want to get as many people on the planet to know this. Yeah. And what better way than to write a book? Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, in your book, you talk about a mind map. And yes. I want to hear more about this. What is a mind map? Mind mapping is something that I've discovered uh, a number of years ago. Before I even started writing books, I, I use mind mapping for all sorts of things. And I realized that we've been taught to plan by making lists. However, our brains don't work in list format. You know, we'll think of one thing and then suddenly that will spark off an, uh, an idea somewhere else. And then that will spark off another idea elsewhere. And then that might spark an idea back to the original idea. Or it might not. It might go elsewhere. And um, that is how the brain thinks. Well, when you mind map, what you can I use online mind maps, but you can actually just do it by paper and pen. You just take a sheet of paper. You start off in, in the middle with your main idea. 
And then you just start making these lines or spokes away from the main idea to make smaller ideas. And then you make even smaller ideas and even smaller ideas and you just keep going. And it's all by breaking everything down. I have mind maps for my business. I've even made a mind map for a holiday or a vacation. Now you guys call it a vacation. Huh. <laughs> I even made because I just w- wasn't. There was so many things that I wanted to do huh. that I made a mind map of my vacation. Wow! <laughs> and it, I know, and then made sure that I got all the things I wanted to do, and I made sure I had a budget for everything that I wanted to do, and I didn't run out of time. So I found mind mapping amazing for organization of anything in my life, whether it's my business, whether it's a vacation. But books has been the big one for me. And it's something that I now teach my clients because once they understand how to mind map a book out, you get into this enviable, almost mythical position where you can literally be contributing to your book, even if you just have a half an hour of downtime between clients or between appointments, Mm -hmm. which sounds almost like impossible. A lot of people, when they come to me, they go, no, you can't that doesn't happen I need to spend the the hours and hours yeah yeah exactly (laughs) the traditional way of writing a book hope is you need to have a book day some people do is you know they'll say Friday is my book day right so Friday is a day that I'm going to sign to work towards my book the concept that you can literally make half an hour useful towards your book it's foreign to a lot of people because they just think by the time I've figured out where my train of thought was, yeah. the half an hour's gone, you know? <laughs> yeah. So how on earth, how on earth is that going to work? Right. Whereas when the way I show them how to write a book, they plan everything out first into a mind map. So when the mind map is done, just to give you an idea, my clients would, I would expect a mind map to have at least 300 to 350 points on there. So just go show the level of detail they're going into the mind map. Once everything is out of their brain and into their mind map, now they've kind of got like this, I call it, jokingly call it a satellite navigation system for your book, which means you know exactly what you're going to say next and then what you're going to say after that and then what you're going to say after that. So even if you just have 15 to 20 minutes downtime, you can just look at your mind map and go, okay, this is where I'm at. You can write a few paragraphs and then put it down to one side and carry on with the rest of your day. I don't care how busy you are. You could be the busiest entrepreneur. I have entrepreneurs who have young children as well, wow. as well as they're running a business. Yeah. And they're still able to write a book because of this methodology that I've taught. Wow. Uh, and this come, this is something I found by accident, Hope. This is going from writing my first book as a ghostwriter to then writing my seventh book. And the difference was 18 months and six weeks. Hmm. And that's when I knew I was onto something. And I thought, huh. This is really cool. I can just show people how I'm doing this and then they can write their own books. And that also means they can write it even if they have the busiest of lives. Mm. Wow. That's amazing. And, and you go into how a mind map works in your book, the freedom master. Yes. Yes. I even do like a, in, there's even like a little graph there that shows you a bit of a mind map so you can get it's a very simple concept I mean it's 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 not rocket science once you've figured it out you'll think why on earth did I ever use lists before it just becomes a way of life you just think this is so normal because what Hmm. you're doing is you're mimicking your brain Hmm. wow Amazing. Well, we will put a link to your book in the show notes. So uh, people should definitely check that out if you're interested in learning about the mind maps. So I would love to pull back, bring bring us back to veganism. Yes. And I wanted to ask you, you, you said something earlier about the humane hoax and how you, you were actually fooled by the humane hoax that you got pulled into those products that have those humane labels. It's of course, something that I'm, I'm very interested in to hear about how people get kind of drawn into that humane hoax. Um, well, I think first of all, it's it's pure laziness. I have to be honest with you. Hope. I think <laughs> I think as a species, we on the one hand we're very efficient. On the other hand, we are very lazy. We will always take the course that is takes the least amount of time and effort. Mm. And you know, when you've at that point, I'd been eating meat. I hate even using the word meat. I, I want to actually say eating animals. It's because yeah. then it, it reminds me 
of what I was doing. So I make sure I never go there. But yeah, eating beings, eating animals. I was actually an (laughs) omnivore um, for about 14 years. That's a Mm. long time. So then, and then suddenly I was going vegan. and I just thought, what do I do? And I got so used to eating beings and having, you know, things like milk and cheese. And then someone comes to you and they say, hey, well, this is a humane way of doing this. You know, they they give you the story, don't they? They're obviously they're happy. You know, cows are happy for you to take their milk, which now as a vegan makes zero sense. Because yeah. you just think, well, where where's their child? They don't just lactate for the sake of lactating. Yeah. Humans don't do that. Women yeah. don't just lactate for the sake of lactating. So yeah. why would cows do that? But, you know, at the time, again, that cognitive dissonance, I just thought, oh, well, if they're you know, if they're happy and they're, they're not, you know, kept in crates or anything like that, they can roam around. You get all these images as well, don't you? If you notice with a lot of the, the ones that are the organic farms, the, the images they show of cows, you know, running around a field. Yeah. You see chickens as well. They're running around. They're having such a great time and they're more than happy to lay eggs just for you to eat, you know, and <laughs> they play on that. You know, they, they yeah. play on the imagery they use. I think the imagery is the big thing. Yeah. yeah, there's um there's a, a cheese company here in the UK called the Laughing Cow. Now I just think how grotesque. But yeah. no cow would laugh at the idea of you know you impregnating her and then usually killing off her child so you can then take the milk and turn it into cheese. I mean, how is that a laughing matter in any in any world? Yeah. And yet it's called the laughing cow. It's a picture of a cow laughing. Wow. See, and you see what I mean? It's, it's this kind of imagery that is used that fools you into thinking, oh, well, this is OK. They're happy. You know, mm. I, was, I realize now that, you know, going down the sort of organic farms and, and that sort of thing, it's a bit like saying it's OK to be slightly racist or slightly homophobic. You wouldn't do that. So why do we have this kind of, oh, it's OK can you see what I mean that's how oh, I, that, no that's that, interesting yeah an interesting thought yeah because um, I and that's that was one of the you know key points to really hit me over the last few years I just think well you wouldn't do that you wouldn't be you wouldn't accept slight racism you wouldn't be like oh that's okay that's not really racist it's just a little bit racist it's mm, okay yeah. you wouldn't do that or you wouldn't say oh, it's just a little bit transphobic but that's okay it's, a, it's okay yeah. to be a little bit it's like no zero tolerance right so I now have zero tolerance when it comes to oh it's okay you know it's an organic farm or it's the humane way to treat an animal is to just not farm them at all yeah I, I love that zero tolerance for cruelty, zero tolerance yeah. for commodification of their bodies. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah. Well, Matali, I feel like we could talk all day. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that too. <laughs> it's been wonderful. I've enjoyed this so much. Uh, but we do need to wrap up and we like to end the show with this question. What gives you hope for the future? Oh, God, what gives me hope? What gives me hope is that even in just the 10 years that I've been vegan, there's been an absolute sea change here in the UK. Mm -hmm. Back in 2012, there were still people who didn't even know what a vegan was. They would they would ask me and say, is this a religious thing or I'm like, no. Um, Whereas now in 2022, even people who hate us, at least they know what a vegan is. (laughs) That makes me feel good a step in the right direction (laughs) it is it is but I'm always I'm always a big believer that we are we are getting better hope I just think we're on the right road it it can it can happen faster as far as I'm concerned I think we all want it to happen faster but we're on the right road and and that just that makes me happy and just like being around younger people they seem to be more switched on especially in the UK I mean most vegans are they're usually under 25 Mm. which I think is wonderful because they're the future yeah Yeah, I actually just heard that, and I believe it was the UK that now, was it, I can't remember, but, but something like 5% of restaurants are vegan or 10% of restaurants are vegan. Like, oh, new restaurants that just have opened, I think is what it was uh, in the UK. Are you seeing that? Yeah, I'm seeing that. And it's fantastic. It's absolutely, there there was a time I lived, as you know, in a small uh, city called Gateshead, and 2012, I mean, the idea that there might be a vegan restaurant in Gateshead was just laughable. Yeah. It just wouldn't. So I would have to go, you know, to London a lot of times to, to get really good vegan food. Whereas now even Gateshead has a, a couple of, I mean, not many, but they're there. Yeah. So we're yeah. getting there. 
yeah. there's people just talking about it. I think that's a wonderful, I think that's a wonderful thing. People talk about it. this one um, vegan restaurant in Gateshead just recently stopped putting on their menu. They decided they're no longer going to put that it's something is a meat substitute. Because I just thought it's not a substitute. It just is. That's right. It's not everything. And I just love that. They will get, you know, omnivores who will contact them and say, but is it is it dairy or, for example, a milkshake? They'll say, is it dairy? It's like, well, no, the entire menu is vegan. So you shouldn't even need to ask that. Mm. So then they'll, the omnivores say, well, you should put that it's not dairy milk. It's like, no, why should we put that we're not for torture? Right. <laughs> so we're just going to put it's milkshake. Yeah, that's if right. you're going to assume it's dairy, it's your problem. Yeah. We're just saying it's a milkshake. We're going to use oat milk and soy milk and almond milk and every other kind of milk we can think of. And I thought that's quite brave. That would never have happened 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a great way to normalize veganism. It's interesting because there's both kind of the, the thought that, yeah, we should put vegan on everything. So we're really, you know, promoting it. But then there's the other uh, thought that no, just have it say milkshake, have it say burger to normalize that vegan is the default, that if you see a burger, it should just be vegan. It doesn't have to say exactly. it's vegan. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Where we are now with veganism is the best we've ever been, which then makes me think in 10 years time, where we're going to be and where we're going to be in 20 years time and where we're going to be in 50 years time. So I, I have hope. I've only been vegan for 10 years and I've seen huge changes in the UK and the rest of the world in just 10 years. So that gives me a lot of hope. Well, Natali, thank you so much for being on. It's been wonderful. We'll put uh, all your links in the show notes about your publishing company and your book and everything. And, uh, and I look forward to, to what you're going to do in the future. Thank you so much, Hope. Thank you for listening to the Hope for the Animals podcast, sponsored by Compassionate Living. So I don't do this often, but today, during our last few moments together, I'm going to ask for your financial support. Compassionate Living has a lot of fantastic projects going on beyond this podcast, like the lawsuit against Vital Farms that I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, also the class that I will be teaching at Arihanta Academy, uh, and so much more, and we need your support. We were offered a very generous match grant uh, from an anonymous donor of $12,500 to raise in six months so that it would be doubled, that amount would be doubled to $25,000. And we are about in the middle of that six month time frame and the campaign has kind of stalled. So I'm asking you, my fabulous, amazing, loving, wonderful, compassionate listeners to help me with a generous donation to Compassionate Living's Match Fund so we can double this money and show this donor that we have loyal supporters that believe in the work we're doing. Your donation will make it possible for me to continue this podcast and do all the other Compassionate Living campaigns that educate existing vegans to help them stay vegan and be excellent educators and to inspire pre-vegans to go vegan. It's always hard for me to ask for money. I'll, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm trying to get used to it now that I have stepped into this full-time focus on compassionate living, and I, I have to get comfortable with it because I know that what I'm doing is unique and is important and will touch people in ways that possibly no one else could. So please donate as generously as you can to Compassionate Living's Match Campaign, and I'll put a link, of course, in the show notes. Thank you for your kindness, your compassion, your support, and please live vegan.